Hey, my name is Michelle Graver. I'm the owner trainer at Be Still Canine. Uh, we do private lessons, we do group classes, and board and train. We will be moving to Holly Springs, Mississippi here in about a week, so that's where we'll be located, but we'll cover the surrounding areas as well. Um, I train mostly with positive reinforcement. Uh, however, I don't exclusively train positive reinforcement. A lot of people, it's we, we get confused on the labels, and uh, scientifically speaking, most people don't train exclusively with positive reinforcement. We do have four quadrants of operant conditioning, and I respect all four quadrants, but I just primarily use positive reinforcement. We train basic obedience up to advanced off-leash skills, any type of dog. Um, I got my bachelor's degree at Mississippi State with veterinary technology, so I went to school to be a vet tech, and I decided that's not really what I wanted to do. I wanted to do more with the behavioral side of things. There's, unfortunately, there are some dog training schools, but not a lot of them. It's kind of a new thing to get more of an education for this. So that's something I'm definitely working on. Um, you have to have like 300 hours before you can even apply to take the test. So these are all things that I'm working on. Um, hopefully, hoping to get my CPD TKA this fall so that I will be certified through that organization. We train from the dogs aspect. I'm, we, we have a tendency to anthropomorphize our dogs a lot, so or any of our animals. Um, it's not that I don't love my dogs or I don't think that they love me, but I can't put my human emotions and my human way of thinking into my dogs. I have to understand from their point of view so that they can clearly communicate with me and I can communicate with them what I want them to do. So generally I do train with a lot of treats, um, a lot of treats in the beginning. I usually taper those out. The biggest thing is that we try to find things that are motivating to the dog. Usually that's food. Um, it could be a toy. Uh, sometimes dogs, they really enjoy sniffing on a walk. So if I'm trying to teach and work with them with loose leash wa walking skills, I will not allow them to sniff. I don't want my dog sniffing and walking and lunging at the end of the leash. I need them loose at my side on a leash because that's a safety reason. We don't want our dogs picking up anything off the ground or anything like that. However, I may use that sniffing and that behavior as a reward. So I may give them a release command and say, okay, and they'll go and, you know, that's their reward for walking on loose leashes. They may get to sniff around for a little bit or have a little bit longer leash, but then as soon as I call them back to attention, they need to come back to my side. So anything can be a reward. Um, it's not a lot of people think, oh, well, you just train your dog with food and, you know, they're stuck on food for the rest of their life. That's not true. Our rewards never disappear, but they do get tapered out. So one of the biggest things is that's also very helpful in behavior modification cases as well. Um, food is unparalleled in efficacy of trying to modify behavior, especially with problem, problem dogs, because most of the time when people contact me for their dog that's barking or lunging, other people, other dogs, etc., it is all fear-based behavior. So I'm not going to come in and introduce an aversive um, like a correction because that's not going to help things. That's like you being afraid of spiders and I come in, I bring in a big fuzzy tarantula and I go, man, dude, stop freaking out. And I get onto you and like, you know, get angry with you. Like, why are you freaking out of this spider? There's nothing wrong with it. And then you're just like, that does not make you feel any better, right? Like you're not going to be any less afraid of that spider. You're probably going to continue to act the way you are, if not worse, because now I'm adding more stress to an already stressful situation. So that's kind of the way I treat everything. It's just from the dog's perspective and what helps the dog. Um, sometimes that takes us taking a step down because humans, we are supposed to be smarter. You know, we're supposed to, you know, be smarter and we can't expect dogs to communicate in our terms. Um, so we kind of have to take a step down sometimes and realize that our dogs, you know, as much as they're our babies and our family members, they're not human. And we have to, everything we say, we have to give those words meaning. Uh, my dogs don't come to me knowing how to sit down or know the word yes or whatever. They, they don't know these words. I have to give everything meaning. To understand how we're going to train dogs, we need to understand how they learn. So we're going to have a quadrant. For people wondering, this is, uh, we call it operant conditioning uh, or Skinner's Square um, because that was the scientist that kind of came up with this. So we have a quadrant. We have an R for reinforcement. We have a P for punishment. Now, we're also going to have plus and minus. So the R just simply stands for reinforcement. When I say reinforcement, we are reinforcing a behavior. It is behavior that you would like to keep. 
When I say punishment, I'm simply referring to a behavior that you do not want. You do not want to keep it. Um, a lot of people, they go, Ugh, punishment, I don't want to punish my dog. Punishment, don't, again, don't put your human emotions into this. This simply means you don't want that behavior. You don't want to, you don't want to keep that behavior. You want it to go away. Therefore, we're going to speak in terms of punishment. So we also have positive punishment and we have negative punishment. We have positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement. These positives, these negatives, they only simply refer whether you're adding something to the dog or if you're taking something away. So I'm going to put a positive and negative on each of these. So there's your square. And then we're also going to have extinction. So positive reinforcement. Example, you are adding something to the dog to keep a behavior around. So we're going to add something. It could be treats. That could be, like I said, toys. You're, you're rewarding the dog for something that it did well because you want to keep the behavior. So for example, I'll say sit. The dog sits. I give them a treat. Uh, say for a child, you know, they get an A on their progress report and the parent gives them ice cream. They are giving something to that child or that animal to reinforce the behavior because they want to keep that. They want to keep those good grades or you want to keep that behavior. Negative reinforcement simply means that you are taking something away to keep that behavior. So the most common example I use for dogs is leash walking. We have to teach our dogs how to turn off leash pressure. If you want them to walk on leash very well, you, they need to learn how to turn off that leash pressure. So you add that pressure, there's going to be a pressure there. And whenever they do the correct behavior, you remove that pressure. Therefore, it'd be negative reinforcement. So you're teaching by negative reinforcement. I would say it's not the most used quadrant over here, but it's very important. Um, I think we actually use that mostly in horses. So I know like when I was training my showmanship horse, um, I use a lot of negative reinforcement because I would apply pressure like a hand that would push on her neck and she took a step away. I'd take off that pressure. That's just the way we train those animals mostly. Then we come into punishment. So these are behaviors that we don't want to keep. Negative punishment is we're going to take something away to get rid of a behavior. So say the dog starts to jump on me and I don't want them to jump on me. It's a behavior you want to get rid of. I had some food that I was about to give it and I take that to, I tilt away. I take the food away from the dog. Well, that's negative punishment because we're taking something away from the dog in order to get rid of that behavior. Say if your child makes really bad grades on their report card and you take away their bicycle, negative punishment. So then we get into positive punishment. And this is the topic that people don't want to talk about. I think people use it more often than they realize. They go, oh, positive punishment means you're beating your dog. No, it doesn't always mean you're beating your dog. You're just adding something to the dog to make it uncomfortable to get rid of a behavior. That could be something very mild. It could be something extreme. Regardless, it does fall into the positive punishment category. That could be a prong collar. That could be an e-collar. That could be a flat collar. Anything, anything. You, you can use anything to get rid of behavior. Um, I think people, they don't want to avoid, they, they, want, they just don't want to talk about that quadrant, but it is important. Um, some people, they do avoid it and that's how they train. I respect that. I have no problem with the people that do that. I usually actually don't use this, but maybe 10% of the time I'm training or 10% of the time I'm teaching any, any of my dogs, but it is there because sometimes it comes down to the fact that you may really need to make sure you don't have that behavior because it could be a danger to that dog. So if the dog is lunging at the end of the leash on top of somebody or maybe they jump out in the road or something like that you know i'm not going to judge somebody for coming in and using positive punishment to correct that dog to make sure that behavior goes away because we want to keep our dog safe and then we have extinction and that simply means that if you don't reinforce the behavior if you stop reinforcing the behavior the behavior will probably go away so they did this um skinner did this an experiment and he had um he used this on mice um and so they, he taught them to push a button and the food would come out, for example. And eventually they would put, you know, they push the button, they get food, push the button, get food. They stopped adding the food. They kept pushing the button, nothing happened. They stopped pushing the button, <laughs> nothing, you know what I'm saying? So if you don't want a behavior, you can eliminate reinforcing that behavior and sometimes it'll go away on its own. Um, this is also very important because whenever I'm talking about rewards and using treats and things like that, I do taper away those rewards. Like I said, they never completely disappear because I don't want this to happen. I don't want extinction to occur. As well as sometimes if I don't want to use the P plus or P negative, say sometimes I ignore that behavior. 
sometimes it will go away as well because it's no longer motivating. So say the dog comes up and starts pawing my leg because they want attention and they're just incessant about it. Well, that gets kind of annoying. So I ignore it. I don't, I don't give them any attention. I don't touch them. I don't look at them. Um, and it's no longer motivating to the dog. The dog stops doing it. And as soon as the dog stops doing it, I come in and I reward them by giving them attention. Let them understand that that is how I want them to get my attention is by behaving, um, not being a nuisance to others. And then we have classical conditioning. Classical conditioning, most people um, may recognize that term because of Pavlov's dogs. That was a really famous experiment. He rang a bell, the dog salivated. And the reason that worked is because he had a unconditioned stimulus and a unconditioned response. So he had food and he had salivation. So he realized that whenever the food came out, the dog starts salivate. Well, he starts adding the unconditioned stimulus to a stimulus that he wants to condition, so a bell. He would add those two together and the dogs start salivating and eventually he took away the unconditioned stimulus and just had the conditioned stimulus a bell the dog salivated so this is um very this we use this sometimes mostly in behavior modification um, it's very important very useful but it is not how we primarily teach dogs new things um, those are more helpful in behavior modification cases the, one of the most helpful things you can do when you're training your dog is to introduce a marker of some sort whether that be a clicker or a word, it doesn't matter. It can be anything. You can ring a bell and use it as a marker. It just may not be as efficient for you when you're training. I use the word yes. That is my marker word. That's what I use for all my dogs, simply because I don't like carrying a clicker around with me. However, it does the same exact thing as a clicker. So you have less than two seconds from cause to effect in a dog's brain. So like the study of causality in canines is relatively simple and short. So that is why we tell people you can't punish a dog for potting in your house 30 minutes after you caught it. It doesn't matter. There's no cause and effect for the dog. The dog doesn't understand why the punishment is occurring. If the dog understood and you called it in the act, that'd be different. But 30 minutes later, you're not doing anything. So I introduce marker words. And what I do is I engage my dogs and I will just we kind of call it charging the marker yes treat yes treat yes treat <laughs> and so they have a positive association with the word yes yes means that the treat is coming the reason we use this is because most often you cannot physically pull the treat out of your pocket or bag and put it in the dog's mouth in enough time to reinforce the behavior that you intended to so and I, the, the example I use not that you would ever teach this the example I use is that say I wanted to train my dog to look to the left and I go, oh, good boy, and I go and give him a treat. And by the time I rustle my bag and get the treat into the dog's mouth, he's looking to the right. Well, now I'm just teaching him to look to the right, not to the left. Not that you would ever do that, but that's an example to show why it's so important to make sure you're marking the correct behaviors. So, for example, people think, well, you know, my dog's jumping on me, and the dog goes to jump on you. Well, they're looking for contact. What do dogs like? They like contact. They want eye contact. They want you to touch them. They want to hear your voice that is very rewarding for them so you take all that away you don't touch the dog um as long as you're able to do you're able to ignore the dog and the dog's feet hit the ground boom yes i give them a treat and they go well aren't you reinforcing them to jump no i'm not i'm reinforcing all feet on the ground and that they are correctly giving me a behavior that i want to keep which is standing there and not jumping you know what i'm saying you you don't have that kind of a problem because again it's it's less than two seconds you have to have calls and effect the dogs need to understand that when this happens this effect comes into play so marker training is very very important i think that's probably one of the most helpful things that i've talked about with my clients is using a marker it, it makes training go so so easy so fast and that's not to say that you can't train a dog without it um so back in the old days or not say old days i mean a lot of people still train with compulsion so they want to teach their dog to sit and they take their hands they push the dog into a sitting position and good job we don't have to do that anymore um, we with, with marker training it's very easy to avoid having to do that in relation to marking and marking behaviors we come into luring and bribing and the reason i mentioned bribing is because people confuse the two um, they think they're luring but really they're bribing and there's there it's a really thin line between the two but there is difference we often lure our dogs into certain behaviors so that we can mark or capture that behavior. So for example, to teach the most basic command, sit, I will have a treat in my hand. And before I ever did this, remember, I had to charge that marker. They had to understand what that marker means. And a lot of times when I'm doing that, I'll play a little game where I'll actually have them chase my hand. So I'll mark them for 
luring to my hand. So I call it hand targeting because that's going to be very helpful to build more advanced commands. So I'm already getting to the point where I want them following my hands. I take my hand, I may take a treat if needed, and I pull it in front of the dog's face upwards and slightly to the back. Well, wherever their dog's nose go, the butt goes the opposite direction because in order to follow it has to travel in the opposite direction. If you tilt your dog's head to the right, their butt's going to turn to the left. Very nice to understand that because you can lure them into doing all kinds of different things. So for sitting, a lot of times if you try to lure their head back and up, it will cause their hind end to come down and they'll sit. And every time I do that, yes, good, you know, yes, treat, yes, treat. And we do that over and over and over again until the point every time I bring my hand up, a lot of times I'll um, introduce physical cues. So for me and my dogs, if I put my hand in a fist, that means sit. Um, if I put two fingers and I point them down, that means down for my dogs. It could be anything, every, you know, they're, they're blank slates. You have to give these, these signs and these commands meaning. So at this point, I'm keeping the treat in my fist. I put it in front of their face and they're automatically sitting, boom, boom, boom. You basically already have a physical cue at this point. And then what I start doing is I add the physical cue and then I add the verbal cue right next to it and I start to fade out that physical. And eventually you'll have a verbal cue, sit, and they sit. And you can usually do that. Like that sounds really complicated, but often it only takes 10 minutes. <laughs> so that's, it's really important. I think it's probably another very useful tool that owners whenever they start training their dogs with, um, with the professional trainers that they get is the fact that they're learning how to mark their dog's behavior, they're learning how to lure them into the behaviors, and the big thing is how to not bribe your dog. So after we get that behavior and it's starting to get to a command, the treats need to go back into the pocket or your bag or wherever you keep them. You don't want to have to wave the treat in front of the dog's face in order to get them to do anything. And different dogs are going to, they're going to have different rates of learning, just like with people. Um, some dogs learn a little faster than others. So how long it takes you really just depends on your dog. You want to, but you, the goal is to eventually get the food back into your bag, into your pockets where you're not dangling in front of their face. And then you never give the, you never pull the food out until after the behavior has been executed. So after their butt hits the ground, you say yes. And then you give them the treat. The yes means that the reward is coming and then you give them the reward. It comes after the behavior. A lot of people, what they do is they, oh, I can't get my dog to do it. And they, they get out that piece of food and they bribe them on their face and get them to do everything. So they can't get their dog to come up. They don't have a good recall. So they sit there and, oh, well, come here. And here I have some tasty chicken. Please come here. And once they get there, then they give them the food. Well, that's bribing. Yeah, it's very thin line. The biggest thing is that if you're going to lure a behavior, that you fade out that lure right after, you know, you fade it that day. Like, don't. Don't, you should not have to continue to bring food out to get your dog to do everything. But you should always reward your dog. Okay, and I mentioned fading out hand signals. Some people don't want to do that. They want to give silent commands. That is perfectly fine. However, there's probably going to come a time where you want to give a verbal command. And if you ever want to give a verbal command, you have to fade out that physical marker at some point. You have to. Physical commands often always, almost always, precede any verbal ones. A dog is more likely to listen to verbal i mean they're going to communicate more through your physical commands than you will verbally and, you, and think about it this way how do dogs communicate to each other body language it's all about body language you know they don't sit there and bark to each other like they're talking like people they body language so dogs will respond more to a physical cue than they will a verbal one but in order to train the verbal one you have to get rid of the physical one now however just because you get you, you fade that out doesn't mean it disappears completely alternate reinforce both so after you get your your verbal one reinforce it and then go back and practice with just the physical and you'll realize that the dog never forgot you put up that physical sign boom and they're you know say they'll actually probably respond to that better than your verbal cue it's just important that if you ever want to get the verbal cue you're going to have to fade out that physical one at some point because if you don't then you're never going to be able to get your dog to do it just with a verbal cue